Now we're going to shift into Europe, what's happening in Europe. And obviously the ECB is, uh, is coming tomorrow. We're coming into what is going to happen with PEPP. You know, we're starting to get some talk of reopening. We have some shifts in terms of uh, what's happening in Germany. So again, there's a, there's a lot to discuss. So first let's look at the EM, uh, the emerging market uh, vaccine rollout, because it's not only impacting just emerging markets, but it's also impacting Europe in general. So when we look at the U.S., we continue to see growth. Uh, India is moving in the right direction, Alabama's slow. But when we look at Europe, you know, Germany starting to come up, the, the trend, we're starting to see some of these movements, but they're missing there's an unwillingness now with AstraZeneca, some concerns about the blood clots, which is is hindering some of the willingness to get specific different dosage. And then you have India hiccups, which is impacting emerging markets. Again, these interruptions is going to become a bigger problem, especially when you look at you know, Europe and Germany in general, which is a buyer of raw materials. So when you have some of these emerging markets where they buy a lot of these raw materials, still struggling to roll it out. There's going to be a cost issue. There's going to be a delivery time problem, which is going to continue to be some of the uh, the overhangs in general. So let's put it in, into, per, into perspective. So when you look at the, the chart from previous on the U.S. on delivery times, you know, supplier delivery times, input prices, output prices, well, let's look at Germany. So Germany supplier delivery times are continuing to go up, something similar to where the U.S. is, but in output prices are only st- they haven't reached the level of the U.S. yet. Speaking to where they are on the reopening side, so as reopening start to happen, you're going to start to see some of those output prices go up. You're going to start to see some of that acceleration, which is just going to keep pushing this higher. So on global de- uh, supply disruptions, supplier delivery times uh, continue higher. But does that translate into inflation? Signs of that happening in the U.S. more so than Germany. So we're seeing the U.S. We're at the tip of that spear where Germany is going to be behind. So I think what's happening in the U.S. right now is going to be reflective of what's going to happen in Germany. Now, if we just look at the CPI data that came out on the 15th, when we look at Germany, you know, when we look at year over year, CPI in the EU harmonized year over year is at 2% expectations. Everything came in right with expectations across the board. Now, when we look at, um, at, at France, 1.4%, right in with expectations. Again, these are things when we look at, okay, CPI year over year, it was at 1.7%. So we're still seeing that shift higher month over month up 0.5%. The push is still up, which is why we continue to see something similar in Germany, which is going to weigh on just water import prices, export prices, again, leading to some of those uh, those other slowdowns. And this is just another way to show it. So when we look at German PPI, expectations were for 0.6, came in at 0.9. So we're seeing, again, from the manufacturing. So this is showing you business inflation that will inherently get pushed down to the underlying consumer and continue to drive those prices higher. Now, when we look at other PPI prices throughout the region, so when we look at Spain, Spain year over year at 4.8%, uh, you know, month over month, de- uh, negative 0.2%. Then when we look at Germany and on just a year over year up 3.7%. So you have the base effect and then you have obviously the month over month to just kind of shave out or pull back on what that base effect is. So it's just continuing to push up in general with more coming from uh, from Poland coming in at 3.9% or 1.3%. You, uh, so it, it just leads to the issue of all of Europe, Eastern and Western, that are seeing these inflationary pressures that are not going to go away. So then when we look at household consumption and where household consumption is versus where prices are, Here's where when we look at Europe in general and what those situations are. So house prices continue to go up, but household consumption has been fairly muted. And it's a matter of where do people have credit? Do they have savings? What are they willing to do at that point in time? Which is why we we continue to see some of the slowdown in European buying because the consumer, while housing prices are going up, are spending less and are trying to adjust for just where 
things sit like things are not going as well in Europe as in other places, specifically the US, which is limiting the consumer. Now the consumer was already weakening prior to COVID. So this just layered on another another uh, pain point. And then when we look at real estate transactions on tenant owned flats, you know, here you can see where 2020 was. So 2021, the, the people are still looking to buy. They're still looking to real estate. And when you look at inflation and you look at where, um, you know, rates are obviously within Europe specifically, you continue to see the drive to own real estate transactions on houses. You can see that 2021 continues to be that big outlier and it's, it's becoming a better opportunity given just where some of the data sets are. You'd rather have an asset to protect against some of this inflation and have some leverage. Now, industrial orders have picked up in some spots, but then when we look at at just unemployment rates in general and where the Eurozone aggregate data has been pointing us, we have to look back to trade balances. So trade balances have gotten a bit better uh, in, in, uh, in the Eurozone, but they missed expectations in February we don't see that changing all that much in terms of where that is going to go because trade balances are going to be impacted based on some of these problems in the market in general. Like right now, something just came across used car prices leap on U.S. economic recovery. So secondhand, uh, an index of U.S. used car vehicles are went to a fresh new high in April, which again is is leading to is just showing you just what is happening in the market on an, on a price level. And it, the same thing is happening in Europe and at, at just a slower pace, just given where we are in the reopening schedule. So construction output was, was down in February. It, was, uh, it came in at negative 2.1%. Construction output year over year, negative 5.8%. These are the, the pain points. CPI throughout all of the Eurozone aggregate came in at 0.9%. Uh, month over month. So again, we're still getting this drive higher, but even though when we talk about the US, the US uh, EU 27 new car registrations are up 87.3% in March. So we're starting to get some of those movements in the back end, which is why when we look at pricing and inflation expectations in general, it's going to move higher. Now, when we shift to what is the ECB doing as we go into next uh, into tomorrow, you know, based on what we're thinking and what we're seeing, the ECB is going to stay the course. There's not much that's going to change. You can see that gross pur purchases have accelerated. Net purchases are fairly flat, but gross purchases have gone up as uh, as redemptions of 12.1 billion and uh, PEPP largest on record and 9.5 billion and PSPP leading to the highest gross PEPP purchases since June 2020. So again, that we they talked about accelerating, and we got that acceleration. So those accelerations again are speaking to things getting a little bit better and and pulling down some of the redemptions. But at the same time, the ECB is going to keep being uh, supportive, which leads to inflation and other types of those expectations. Now, when we look at Italy, because Italy has come out and it continued to push more debt. Uh, they've they've given some backdrops of where that debt will be focused and how it will be distributed. But when we just look at where that expectation is going, again, we keep talking about Italy's debt burden going to 160% of GDP, which is why there's that drive to get out of the limitations on movement. You know, the trend has been coming down with new cases. So as they come down, we should start to see this get better. <clears throat> And we should start to see that reopening hold at the end of at the um, uh, at the beginning of next week. The problem is, without enough vaccines, are we going to see another surge? And that's going to be the the piece to watch in terms of what does that reactivity look like, and will that result in additional cases? Now, even if it doesn't, even if they don't have a big spike, you know, based on what we've seen in general, you kind of flatline on case counts, which is still going to limit the amount the consumer is willing to do, even though obviously they will do more. So then when you look at manufacturing selling prices, PPI X energy, this is what we keep talking about with those selling prices are going up, which is just going to pull that PPI up. When we look at the, the supply chain of inflation, because Europe is going to be an interesting uh, case study as they start to reopen and they do have negative rates. So really what can be done next to try to prop up the economy without creating, you know, runaway inflation or inflation starting to run a little too hot. 
So then when we look at construction, this is what we were talking about before with that construction starting to roll over where buildings and civil engineering and, and given February was a little bit light, you know, we saw some of the, the pickups, but then obviously toll road data has started to, to, to slow down a bit in April. That's due to COVID cases rising in some locations, but also the Easter holiday. So there's going to be some of that seasonality involved, but it just speaks to kind of this flatlining. Now, we're not going to come back to a, a hundred or, or equal against baseline, but we're just going to see this, this flatten out a bit. And instead of going back up, just stop going down, which again is going to speak uh, to more pressure in the, uh, in the uh, underlying economy. Now, when we look at new passenger car registrations, you can see that there's typically that spike that happens on a seasonal level. We're getting back to some sort of normalcy. You know, it's it's back into the positive territory, which just means that people are feeling better about getting out, getting a new car. This is a, a positive move. And when we look at the accumulative year to date, we're starting to, cl- we're, we're starting to see some of this normalcy outpace 2019, uh, uh, 2020. Clearly, and again, this is what we like to talk about in the U.S. as well in the EIA show. It's it's going to get better. It's just going to be at a at a lower level than previous because people don't have the money to spend on cars. Things are a bit more expensive in Europe. That's going to mitigate how much normalcy we get and how much people really come back into to get a new car versus a used car. So then, when we look at the popular vote in uh, in in the federal election for Germany, so. The Green Party is starting to get more f- influence within the region. So the CDU, SPD, which is, is losing a certain amount into the Green Party, which is why they're becoming more focused on what is their green initiative, what are green bonds, what does this renewable push look like, because they need to adapt to try to get some of these components and some of these votes to get some of that support going forward. And we're, and you know, the, it's going to be a very interesting election, which we'll go through in a bit more detail next week. Cause we're going to assemble, you know, what are the, what are the um, people look like? Are they pro Europe, uh, you know, kind of more uh, nationalistic? Are they more in favor of uh, the green movement or do they want to, how does China fit into their policies? Because there's a lot of unknowns, especially on the pi- on the China side, because the EU still hasn't ratified the trade deal and China's trying to put pressure on them to do so. But there's always those questions on, well, uh, human rights, what does that look like? Again, these are some of those pressure points. Then when we look at uh, the French manufacturing and selling price, so manufacturing selling price expectations, <laughs> I, I just laugh because it's, it's just funny in terms of where the, these, these numbers are going. And then service uh, selling price expectations. So the services are starting to get a bit more expensive, but obviously the manufacturing side is taking off as a, as a reflection to where is the underlying inflation? How is it going to get passed through? Who's going to eat the most of it? And again, these are the, the kinds of pressures that we continue to see in the market that I think is, is it's just showing that Europe is going to be subject to some of the similarities and pressures that the U.S. has, has gone through. The question is, is it going to see the same GDP bump because of it? Or will it lag like we've already seen? Uh, and as we were saying earlier, or last week rather, you know, GDP expectations have been reweighted lower as you know some of these lockdowns pro- get prolonged. And now that they're facing rising inflation, is that going to hurt the consumer more? And you're going to get even more pressure on what that recovery looks like because Europe doesn't have the same types of benefits of the U.S in terms of competition or in terms of movements, you know, there's still going to be limited tourism and how is that going to inter- impact, you know, not only just the local economies, but also the broader European economy, which I think is going to be a bit more severe versus the U S. So that's where you have to weight some of these European GDP numbers lower versus obviously what does stimulus do for Europe versus the U S. But now that we've covered uh, Europe, we're going to shift into Asia a bit more and go in depth into exports, imports, trade, and then what is the underlying Chinese data telling us as we go into uh, the, the next cycle, really, of, uh, of data sets through Q2 and into Q3.